Thank you. Uh, so folks, just a quick update. Uh, we now have 10,478 patient applications received by OMC. Uh, the rate of applications continues to accelerate um, early in 2022. We were receiving about 100 a week. Uh, now we receive about 250 a week. So as anticipated, as more and more facilities open across the state, uh, that uh, application rate continues to increase. Uh, we have seven operational growers across the state, three operational processors, and 19 operational dispensaries. And I do want to point out that every major region of the state does have an operational dispensary now. Uh, <clears throat> not all of those are open to the public, uh, specifically in the Eastern Panhandle, but those should be opening over the weekend. Uh, so every, every Every large portion of the state is covered by uh, a dispensary that patients can access. And that situation uh, will keep getting better and better as the year goes on. Uh, next slide, please. So we've sold uh, $5,436,295 in medical cannabis products uh, as of this morning. <clears throat> We've sold 86,764 individual products and 706 pounds of flour in the state. Any questions about uh, that progress update from the Office of Medical Cannabis? Dispensary, are those, um, these dispensaries for um, dispensing those, are those specifically for cannabis or are those pharmacies handling yes, those? Yes, Dr. Khan, those are specifically medical cannabis dispensaries licensed by OMC. Uh, they don't sell any other products beyond accessories to facilitate the use of medical cannabis. Okay, thank you. Hey, Jason. Yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned in your comments there that there's a dispensary getting ready to open in Eastern Panhandle. Is that, is that what I heard you say? Yes, uh, they should be opening over the weekend. And okay. that will complete the coverage of every major region of the state. And I was going to say that was one of the major comments you had in the public comments. Yes, sir. We, yep. uh, we know that, due, especially due to the geographic difficulties of the Eastern Panhandle, uh, patients uh, in that area have uh, very much been looking forward to uh, a local dispensary. So that, that issue will be resolved over the next couple of days. Whereabouts will that be located roughly? Martinsburg. Okay, thanks. So are those number, like I see uh, seven or 10 dispensaries, whatever, are these enough or there are more coming in? Yep, so there are definitely more coming in. We have 100 dispensaries permitted. Uh, those folks are in various stages of building out. Uh, we expect the numbers to continue to increase uh, throughout 2022. Um, <clears throat> it's not a guarantee that all 100 uh, will open, uh, but we're certainly inching closer to that number every day. And we had oversight kind of, uh, if they're handling and um, dispensing in the, following the guidelines, right? Yes, sir. We do an operational inspection to make sure the facility is completely ready uh, before they open and then fo follow that up with compliance inspections on a regular basis. And also, of course, they must report all their sales uh, through our electronic seed to sell system. So they are, are very closely monitored in their activities. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions regarding OMC progress? Okay, Glenba, next slide, please. And we'll turn it over to Mr. Forbes for an update on the policy and program work group. I do want to point out, however, that the health and medical work group was not able to meet uh, during this uh, period between main MCAB meetings due to uh, uh, member availability. Mr. Be Forbes, uh, please be proceed. Sorry, before, uh, I'm sorry. I just had a quick question for Jason before uh, before you get into the the work group breakdown. Yes. Uh, 
The last time we met, uh, you, you said that the OMC was taking between two and three weeks to process applications. And I'm just wondering if that, if, is that still the way it's going or has that process, you know, been streamlined any further or what, what's the wait time looking like right now? Sure. Right now we're at about two weeks. Uh, some of those can range down to only one week, uh, but uh, uh, two weeks is a good average. Uh, certainly, we're, we're really proud of being able to get that number down. Uh, again, earlier in the year, we were running about two months. Uh, so we were able to cut <laughs> down all the way to two weeks at this point. Uh, over 94% of the applications that we've received have been processed. Uh, however, there's always going to be a differential between applications received and applications approved. Uh, our biggest holdup on that is waiting for payments uh, that are associated with the applications. And also, of course, corrections to applications such as uh, pictures or IDs or proof of residency. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. This is Jesse Forbes. Um, just as a sort of a brief update from our meeting, uh, our work group met on June 1st. Uh, we had a guest speaker from the West Virginia State Police, uh, Michael Smith, the longtime trooper, to give us some background and information on how law enforcement um, handles and, and sort of plans to handle uh, impairment with respect to driving uh, or operating machinery for folks that are utilizing medical cannabis. And so we had a, a long discussion about that. We heard from the trooper about sort of historically what had happened. Um, you know, obviously part of the issue is, is that uh, there's this, the states, there's no uniformity around the country right now in terms of uh, what nanogram levels um, could be sort of prima facie evidence of someone being impaired. One of the issues obviously uh, that was brought up is, is that um, the metabolism time is very different from something like alcohol uh, where you can have an intoxilizer that could measure whether someone's over uh, a certain level of alcohol and then presumptively would be driving under the influence with cannabis. Uh, it tends to stay in the blood much longer and also tends to build up over time if people um, utilize it uh, regularly. So we, we heard from the trooper about things officers have been doing uh, with respect to personal observations and things along those lines. And we had a, a sort of a spirited discussion and a good discussion about that. We really didn't leave the work group with any specific recommendations on that topic. Uh, I will note that as was discussed last time, um, we have previously with the work group discussed home grow. And I know that um, Rusty's on here and that was something that, you know, we had carried over from the last full board meeting to this meeting. Uh, so I don't know whether that's something that we need to address at this point, but I will just tell you from an, from an update perspective, we've had those conversations in the past. Our next work group um, is, is something that we've talked about. Uh, Mr. Deegan's on here and Joe's uh, uh, been sort of adamant that we try to address the healthcare issues and the issues for hospitals with respect to how to handle um, patients that have medical cannabis. So that's something we're going to take up at the next policy and program work group, but I hope that's an update. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Forbes about the policy and program work group and their activities? I have a quick question. Sorry, I have a quick question. Um, you mentioned you're going to talk about like how patients will be dealt with in the hospitals. Has any of those discussions started or that stuff you're going to have to address um, from scratch also? Yeah, I, I think we, we intend to sort of address it from scratch at this point. Um, we, we're hoping to have some speakers lined up at the next policy and program work group, which could give us some insight. Um, I I am hoping to have some folks from the legal field, and I think Joe was going to work on trying to get some folks from hospital administration to try to give us a sense of how this is being dealt with around the country and how West Virginia might tackle those same issues. I'll just echo, uh, Jesse, that yes, there's already communications with uh, the WVU's health system, but yeah, I think they've got a policy that they have uh, developed that we probably need to review. Uh, that was from back in December and uh, ask for them to, you know, maybe uh, actually present that policy at the next meeting. 
So it's not like there's nothing to work from. We do have some in-state. I mean, we probably need to get some out, you know, some people from out around different states to give some input too. And also on the impairment, in, we, we didn't make a decision because I think we, we still need some further um, input on impairment. Um, and that, yeah, that was another thing that we're probably going to have to bring up back at the policy meeting at some later date to further uh, resolve questions and concerns about that. Thanks, Joe. And yeah, just to follow up to that, I, I, I hope you didn't think what I mean, mean that West Virginia doesn't already have um, entities that are looking at these issues. It's just that from the policy and program work group, we've not addressed it to the point where we're ready to make a recommendation. But I, I would right. hope that after we meet and we hear from the folks from WVU, and I anticipate some, some people in the healthcare uh, legal field that could give us some guidance we may be in a position where we can make a recommendation for the next meeting as to something that the board may want to recommend to the legislature to adopt. Yeah, I'm unsure that that the scope of this committee, uh, the policy committee, would be to legislate or codify what hospitals should do with in, in relationship to cannabis. Um, so I just wanted that to be on the record. This is going to be a difficult lift if we're going to try to force this issue. Um, WVU has led the way, and, it, and we did that in order to provide our system hospitals a guide to follow. Um, and that's, that's just, I wanted that to be known. I appreciate that. And just to be very clear, we obviously as an advisory board, we're not going to legislate anything. Um, all we're looking at from the work group perspective is whether there are recommendations that that might make sense, frankly, to help the entities that are dealing with this. I mean, if WVU has has already um, addressed a number of these things, if there's some if there's a, a need for a change in the law, that's what we're looking at. And so I, I don't want to make it sound in any way like from, from our work group, we're gonna be suggesting that we do something that would um, adversely affect what the hospitals are doing. I think what we're looking at is just, is there, a, is there anything that might be needed for a law change? And obviously from this advisory board, we don't make the law. All we ultimately would do is send a recommendation to the legislature and the governor if there is something that we see or that the stakeholders of WDPs that might need to be changed in the law to help them. So I just want to make sure that that's understood. Any other questions for Mr. Forbes? Okay, thank you, Jesse. Uh, Glenda, next slide, please. And folks, I do want to, again, say please mute your mic if you're not actively speaking. And I'm specifically referring to the guest under the name Tom. <laughs> Tom, please mute your microphone. Microphone, thank you. Okay, uh, so more old business. Uh, during the last main MCAB meeting, we had several guest speakers uh, to contribute to Rusty's home grow uh, proposal. Uh, we want to continue that discussion. Uh, that meeting did run uh, significantly over time, so I did send a recording out to all the members. Hopefully you had a chance to review that if needed. Uh, but Rusty, I'll turn it over to you to continue that discussion of your proposal. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, I'm not sure what, you know, what more there is to discuss really. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've been talking about the issue of, of patient home grow now for a, more than a year and a half. Um, we've had folks from the regulatory side of things and from the policy side of things from uh, Michigan and Ohio and Colorado come in and share their thoughts. We've had law enforcement, uh, retired law enforcement come in here and share their concerns with home grow. Um, you know, I think that we've, we've covered all the bases as far as bringing in folks to talk about this issue. Um, and to me, it, it just boils down to, to a simple question, you know, um, should, West Virginia patients should poor people in these in economically depressed communities be allowed to grow small amounts of medical cannabis for their own personal use. Um, you know, when when we 
the first time we met uh, with the the policy um, work group, we brought in um, Mr. Koski. I believe the OMC didn't OMC invite him. I, I'm not sure who invited Mr. Koski. That, that's correct, Rusty. Okay, um, you know, and, and he's worked on the he worked on the regulatory side of things in Colorado, and he he acknowledged at the beginning there was some concern that we were going to let patients grow and it was going to turn into these big, you know, illegal operations and create a lot of diversion and a lot of problems, um, basically fueling the black market. And, um, you know, Mr. Koski said that Colorado did have that problem when they first implemented, um, you know, when they first allowed people to grow because they didn't have any caps on it. There were, you know, people could grow as much as they wanted. Caretakers could grow for five patients and what was happening they were renting warehouse spaces and basically just trying to build little empires. And, um, you know, that problem was addressed and corrected. Patients now can grow six plants in their home. Actually, any, any person in Colorado, uh, 21 or older can grow in their home. And he said that by bringing the, the plant count down, that solved a lot of their problems. Um, you know, when we heard from Mr. Finn and Mr. Dokes about the illegal grows in legal states, um, you know, the, all of the the horror stories that we've heard pertaining to this were all basically directly related to a legal industry, and that's not what we're talking about here in West Virginia. We're ta we're talking about patients who have to register with the uh, the DHHR and the OMC. They're on a registry that law enforcement has access to that information. Uh, should there be any instances of suspected diversion? Um, you know, the bases have pretty much been covered here. And I think that if we recommend that the legislature do what they've already done, uh, you know, in 2021 and 2022, there were bills passed through the Senate that did allow limited patient home grow. I think one of the bills went through that allowed 12 mature plants and 12 premature plants. Um, the last time I was in discussions with, with Senate leadership, they were talking about six to 12 plants. Uh, which I think is is more than fair, but with inflation, with COVID, you know, people are paying five bucks a gallon at the pump. They're paying five dollars a gallon of milk at the grocery store. People are struggling right now just to keep the lights on and to keep food on the table. And these medical cannabis products and dispensaries are expensive. And for a lot of folks who really need this medicine, um, yes, it's legal. And I'm Super happy to see dispensaries opening up all across the state. Um, those numbers were very encouraging. I think $5 million in, in product sales this early in the game is very encouraging for the future of our industry here. Um, but I think that folks who don't have the financial means to, to access those, those products should not be left out of the game. And to me, home grow is uh, the best way to facilitate best patient access in these in these poor communities and to me again it go it just boils down to a, a simple question should we as a board recommend that medical cannabis patients can cultivate small amounts for personal use and to me you know the answer to that question is yes um i don't know i i guess a motion needs to be made to take a vote on this uh on on the deal is that correct like i think we need to discuss it first and before voting so you can make a motion and to see if we want to discuss it further, then we can move, move on from there. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I will say that Ms. Satori, Lissa Satori, who's worked on the regulatory side of things in Michigan and Ohio, Dr. Greg Gerdeman is one of the most respected scientific voices in the medical cannabis industry. Dr. Sue Sisley, who has led the world in um, research with connecting the therapeutic uh, benefits of cannabis with PTSD. Uh, she she did her her research there at Arizona State University. Um, they've all made themselves available to come back in and continue the conversation. So if there are folks on this board who have you know serious concerns or serious questions that you know um, that you you feel need to be asked before we take a vote, um, you know this this issue is extremely important to me. Patient access is the most important of all of our charges in my in my mind and. Um, you know, they've, they've made themselves available to come back and answer any of these questions. So I'm willing to, to facilitate the discussion and however the board members feel we need to, to proceed. But um, yeah, if, you, if anybody has any questions for me, you know, fire away. I have just a few questions like related to this. Number one would be, do we have any estimated number of questions? I know 
in the last slide you have shown, Jason have shown that you have about more than 10,000 patient applications. So if, if it is to open, how many you think that um, patient might be um, interested in growing at their home? That is one thing. Do we have regulatory capacity to oversee all those homegrown materials? And uh, also with that, I think anybody who wants to grow, um, that should be only that amount can be allowed depending on the, that patient's prescription, like how, how much a month or day or whatever they are using um, and th they are needing. So maybe they will be allowed to grow that much, not, not too much. And it is understandable, yes, that would help them financially, but we need to answer all those questions and because this has to be regulated. Absolutely. And, um, you know, a lot of those questions have been asked in, in our work group and as well as with the full, the full board. And, um, you know, as far as going in and regulating each home grow, that's, that's, that would be a regulatory nightmare. Um, you know, I'm not sure that the OMC or the DHHR, there's any entity in West Virginia that would have the capacity to go into people's homes and do that. And plus, I think that's also, uh, you know, you've got privacy issues that come into play with that. But as far as you know, preventing diversion and all of that, like I say, in order to, for a patient to grow, um, according to the language that the legislature has passed through the Senate twice, you know, they, they have to be registered medical cannabis patients. So when you register with the DHHR, the only entities that are able to access the list of patients, um, you know, law enforcement, if there's, if there's suspicion of diversion, they do have access to that information. So, um, you know, they, they have the ability to regulate and to, and to go in and investigate on a case-by-case -case basis, I guess. Um, as far as uh, the question of how many people would grow, it's not easy. And, and this is one of the things that we also heard from the regulators. In a lot of states where medical cannabis is legal to grow, most people don't do it. Um, it's not easy to grow medical-grade cannabis. Um, it's not easy to grow just cannabis, period. Most people, if you give them the option to go to a dispensary and buy the products that they need, they're going to do that versus painstakingly taking care of, you know, a plant or a handful of plants for four to six months just to hopefully get some, you know, some medicine that they can benefit. Most people will probably utilize the dispensary system and not grow. Um, I'm concerned with the folks who don't have the financial or the transportation means to, you know, to access products at the dispensary that those are the people that I'm most concerned with. I've tried to make it to as many of the dispensary openings as I can. And um, there has been a common conversation happen at every single one of them. Um, the last two dispensary openings I went to, I spoke with patients who were literally crying. They were there. They were happy to see this program being implemented. Um, they had their cards, but they had no money. They couldn't go in and, and purchase any of these products. So they were there in support, but yet this medicine that's now legally available, they still don't have any access to. And, um, you know, I just, I think that there's a better way to do it. Um, so one way it could be like any patient who wants to grow at home, they, maybe they can apply for permission to grow. And then uh, there might be some, you know, background checking or some mechanism to uh, see that how to regulate and once the regulatory boards are you know satisfied then maybe they can give some permission limited um, permission that, that is how I'm thinking but I don't know how, how others thinking well actually that is um, that's exactly how we tried to push it through the legislature the, the <laughs> language that passed um, if if the legislature would pass the same the same sort of deal it, they created what they were calling compassion certificates um, you know, and the patient would have to apply to be able to grow. Um, and, and, you know, once you were issued that compassion certificate, then you could grow. The, the, again, the plant count was limited. Um, the language said that you could have 12 plants in flowering and 12, uh, you know, 12 immature plants, and they had to be out of public view. There's been discussion about if there were anybody living in the house or on the property that was under the age of 18, that the plants would have to be kept behind lock and key. That could mean a closet that can mean a grow tent that could mean an outdoor greenhouse in your backyard that you know it could they left it open uh, you know and just kept the language of behind lock and key which 
eased the fears of a lot of the lawmakers who, uh, you know, were initially against the uh, the concept of home grow. But these concerns, um, you know, in, in my view, this the, it's not our it's not our task or our charge to to draft the policy, you know, or to create the language that they'll pass. You know, we make the recommendation, and the legislature takes it and does their thing. And, and I just want you to know that. This has been a part of the conversation since the Medical Cannabis Act was passed in 2017, and um, they they've looked at all of all of these um, safety parameters to try to prevent diversion and to try to make sure that patients, you know, if they are growing, that you know they they have a good handle of who is growing and how many plants they're growing, so they can kind of keep up with um, you know what's going on and and prevent diversion because nobody wants diversion to happen. But what I can tell you. Um, you know, when I was going through chemotherapy, it was, it was financially devastated. There's no way, even if there could have been a dispensary on my street, there's no way I could have gone in and afforded anything in there. Um, you know, I was doing, doing well just to keep my head above water. And um, had I been able to grow my own cannabis, that would have been a complete game changer for me in that, in that event. And, you know, um, again, it's not like I think that a lot of times in these conversations, especially when when there have been speakers that have come in uh, specifically to talk against the ability to grow, um, it almost from a patient's point of view makes me feel like they're looking at patients as, you know, well, their first first inclination is to grow to sell or to grow and put it out there to make money. That's not the case. You know, somebody going through what I was going through I mean, I would have been happy if I could have produced an ounce of cannabis myself, I would have been happy with anything I could have produced, you know, and the last thing I would have wanted to do would be to get rid of it. And most patients are in that position. And, um, you know, I just think it's heartbreaking when, when you go to a dispensary and, and I urge all of the board members, if you've not yet gone to a dispensary and, or taken a tour, gone in and talked to these bud tenders, talk to patients, I highly recommend you do that as soon as you possibly can, especially if you can catch a grand opening, because it is very eye opening. You know, we've we've had patients who are suffering through things with like multiple. I, I met a, a man with with MS, and um, you know, just in terrible pain, has been waiting on this program to get kicked off uh, to to be properly implemented since it was um, signed into law in 2017. And he was one of the people standing in the parking lot crying because he knew that. The medicine that he needs is right there behind that door, but it didn't matter when, when it, your prices are $50 an eighth. I mean, it's, it's $400 an ounce in a store. That's just not realistic for a lot of West Virginians. It's not, a, it's not realistic when, you know, you're paying $5 at the pump too. So I, I just think that there are ways to, uh, to make sure that this is done safely and it's done properly properly and to minimize diversion as much as possible. And I do think, you know, it's important to let the board members know that the lawmakers are already looking at that language and they've already passed some of that language. Rusty, I'd like to jump in for just a second to address Dr. Khan's question. Um, certainly, uh, capacity would have to be built at OMC, uh, depending on how legislation may be written. But it's difficult to speculate because, again, we don't know what that legislation would look like. Uh, but almost certainly we would have to build capacity uh, to to uh, regulate uh, this proposal if it were to make it through the legislature. Hey, Jason, this, this is Jesse. Can I jump in just to, uh, to follow up kind of to the doctor's question and, and Rusty's point and just some things that kind of um, have come to light during the years of this of this. Uh, board as well as uh, through our public policy work group. So it, one thing that I think just ha everyone has to keep in mind is th there, there isn't a prescription here with a, with a dosing amount uh, in the way there'd be other medications. And, and that's true whether, whether home grow passes or whether people are going to dispensaries to get cannabis. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it, it, we've heard this from law enforcement and everywhere else, it's a fallacy to think that people aren't already growing and, and um, getting cannabis in West Virginia on the black market. The problem there is it's a street drug. You don't know what's in it. You don't know what's there. And what, what really kind of worries me is, is that if, if there isn't an ability for home grow for these folks suffering from cancer and other dread diseases in a extremely economically depressed state, 
I think you're going to see people, and we've heard from the public comments before, you're going to have patients going out on the street trying to buy cannabis because they think it can benefit them as they go through chemotherapy and other things, but they simply don't have the money to go to a dispensary. And, and I, I, I just, I really don't buy into the argument that allowing a small amount of home grow for someone who has a medical cannabis card, who's going through those types of health problems is gonna turn into some kind of drug dealing situation. Frankly, um, in my experience as an attorney, uh, and I've done a lot of criminal work over the years, if, if folks wanna start growing marijuana in their house and selling it, they're gonna do that. And the other part of this is, is that if they have a medical cannabis card, they could probably go in a dispensary, buy the items and then resell them if that's what they, if they really wanna become nefarious um, uh, uh, criminals. But I don't think that's what we've heard or what we've seen in this. And I think that our charge is to try to find ways to help implement this program to benefit patients and to make sure the program is viable. And I see this as something that, that does do that. I think the, the minutia and the details of it are going to have to be ironed out by the legislature. Whether we would recommend something that is uh, specific with compassion certificates or a specific number of plants, the legislature is gonna take that up. They're gonna address that. They're gonna create their own bill. So, I mean, my suggestion from this would be that along Rusty's lines that we uh, make a recommendation to the legislature that they do allow home grow in a limited capacity uh, for medical cannabis patients, and then leave the details of that to the legislature to iron out similar to the bills that have already gone through. Uh, so that's, that's where I come from it. And, um, and, you know, uh, uh, for what that's worth. I disagree. Right. I think it's too early in the program and you brought up a good point. How will we know that the safety and content of the home grow is any different than what's purchased off the street? This is why the issue of um, concentration was brought up and regulation of concentration. And in fact, in Colorado, we know that they have passed legislation that limits the concentration of THC. Um, and I also wanna add as a point of information that I looked up Dr. Sissel's credentials and she was stripped of her clinical appointment at the University of Arizona. And when I did a PubMed search of her work, I found no peer reviewed articles that described her research. So that concerns me greatly that we're getting bad information from so-called experts. Did you read that she lost her credentials for testing medical cannabis in a country that still has cannabis as schedule one, meaning that it has no medical benefit. That's why she lost her credentials, not because she was doing shady. Well, various, well yeah, uh, we well, live in a country where cannabis is a schedule one. Folks, uh, I want to jump in for just a second. Please, when you comment, please state your name uh, just for my staff's sake when they're trying to create the minutes. Uh, this is uh, J.J. Burnaby. I, I'm with the Board of Pharmacy, the appointee there. Now, I don't speak for the board, but I just wanted to make it clear that's my position. Uh, I'm also a pharmacist. And where I would have concern uh, is that you have these growers that are held to some standard. And I don't know that we have exact rules yet, but they're held to some standard uh, and they're subject to testing of the stuff that they produce, um, we have to have sufficient capacity in place to test the stuff they produce. And there's really no way that, that you're drawing a roadmap to how you can do that with home growth. So from a pharmacist, board of pharmacy, I would be most concerned with what are they growing? What is the strength? and what that is in relationship to what their indication is, that really s seems like there's no, there's nothing. I mean, sure, we don't want it diverted. Nobody does. And, and you know, maybe that is a little bit of a blown up argument that it's all going to be diverted. Okay, let's just take that out of it. Let's say none of it's diverted. We still, you, you know, you're talking about, I hear somebody saying that it's painstakingly hard to grow it correctly. So, that inherently creates a big problem for me when I'm thinking of purity and and um, and strength Natalie, on line and, one for the back. and what 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 the correct indication should be. So so that's just my concern as a pharmacist, uh, and I just wanted to air that. And I appreciate your time, guys. 
this is on. I wanted to add a couple things. One is um, if someone were to grow it at home, like if I want to grow it at home, where would I get the initial product to grow that? Um, I think, you know, that would be a question too. And then my other thing is I would like to hear more either pros or cons about this from more people on the call, but where would I get the initial product to grow it? So Dr. Amjad, I, I think I can take that one or Rusty, you can chime in, but typically in most states, and again, this all depends on what the legislation looks like, but typically in most states, uh, the dispensaries would be able to sell either clones or seeds uh, of these plants. And that's where patients would obtain uh, those products. But again, that, that's totally dependent on what the bill looks like in the legislature. Yeah, hey, Jason. that's the way that I've always heard it too. And not only when it's done, but when it's done that way, patients are buying clones and they're buying seeds that have gone through the metric seed to sale tracking program. So, you know, there's another, um, you know, there's another, I guess, point in the, uh, the line of, of, of accountability, I guess, is, is a good way to say it. So, you know, when, and if you're buying three clones or five clones or whatever from a dispensary, um, those have gone through the same seed to sale tracking program that all of the other cannabis plants that growers and processors have had to enter their information into. So, and, uh, you know, that's another thing. There was, there was a comment earlier about, you know, letting this program get going and all of that, uh, how it's still, you know, still being rolled out. One of the things that I have spoken with multiple dispensary owners about is this program and, um, I've not heard one person uh, stand in opposition. They're actually looking forward to the having the ability to educate uh, patients about home grow and to have you know another source of revenue for their dispensary. So I think that you know not only does it benefit patients, but it does benefit the industry. And as far as the comment earlier about when I said it's painstakingly hard to grow medical cannabis. It is, it is hard to grow the quality of cannabis that you go in and buy at the dispensary. Most people, if they grow cannabis at home, it's going to have far lower concentrations of THC. It's going to have far lower concentrations of all the cannabinoids. Um, they're not using grow accelerators. They're not put, you know, adding crazy nutrients and, and stuff to their soil. The, most people that grow from, you know, from the conversations I've had with patients that grow in legal states, uh, you know, they want as an organic of a product as they can. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, worrying about the THC concentration and stuff in home grow, that's, I, I just don't think that that's a, a problem. Most people, they're not going to grow, uh, you know, a 25 or 30% THC cannabis strain that they could go in and buy the dispensary. Most from, from the data that I've seen, uh, most home grow THC concentrations range between 10 and 12%. So, you know, um, I, I think that's important to, uh, you know, to note in the conversation. And that brings another uh, complication because now, I mean, how do standardize as um, uh, our pharmacist members um, say that how do we standardize this concentration and uh, how do we know how much a patient would need uh, based on the concentration? So that means this is variable. And so there are a lot of unanswered questions there. Well, that goes with the medical cannabis game period. You know, um, that's the thing about this plant. You can grow, I could grow a mother plant and, you know, take clones, take a hundred clones from that same plant. And I'm going to get a hundred different THC concentrations. And I'm going to get the a slight differences in terpene profiles. And this is one of the things that, you know, it, it when we're talking about this and there's a lot of talk about THC concentration and we can't have too much THC. And every time I hear that, it's just, it's like a, a light going off saying, okay, well, there's not enough information. People just don't understand this plant because that THC concentration also has to be looked at, uh, you know, with the CBD and all the other cannabinoids, this, the CBD, like if you go look at products, I'm sure that if you're at all familiar with, with medical cannabis products, you can see that they, they put out one-to-one -one ratios. So every milligram of THC, there's also a milligram of CBD. CBD actually blocks the receptors, the THC receptors in your brain. So there is no high from it, you know? So I think that we're hearing a lot of fear about THC concentrations. And when I hear that stuff, it just tells me that 
people need to get educated on this plant, you know, because terpene profiles, cannabinoid profiles are far more important as to the efficacy of the medicine and how your body responds to it than THC concentrations. I mean, that's just the way it is. Dr. Gerdman, again, one of the leading experts on the scientific end of this has made himself available to come in and talk about it. He's talked about it multiple times with this board. Uh, and he's he's opened himself up to come and talk again. I highly recommend that we get him back in here because, again, it, it seems like every time we meet, there's a lot of conversation about THC content, and all that says to me is there's we just don't know they don't know enough about this plant. Rusty, I, I think just, it this might is, be better. Just digging. I you know I'd like to have my turn on being a board member to make some comments, and I'm on that policy committee with Rusty and. Uh, Jesse, and I disagree with both of you on this one strongly. You know, we heard some strong arguments uh, from Joe Dokes in California and Dr. Finn from Colorado, who neither of which have any, um, you know, financial gain from this. They're both um, people that are, you know, are experiencing problems in other states that we need to pay attention to. And, um, you know, from their comments that we even just read in the minutes, there's some strong arguments to just that this is not a good idea to have homegrown because of experience in other states. It's already shown, even though we anecdotally may feel like, well, no, people are not going to uh, go overboard and growing. But in reality, uh, you know, we need to watch. I mean, we need to take the feedback from other states. And another piece, Rusty, you're bringing up the content issue today that has not even been brought up today and I do take umbrance with the reality that we don't limit ourselves even as board members to how much time we take and need to, to do our presentations it's, it's very difficult to get a word in as wise rusty with the way you are controlling the discussion today and you know and I I just think that <laughs> I just think that's just not appropriate, and and uh, and I I think we need to put some controls on the sharing here. We really did not get a fair chance after that last board meeting to look at at the sides that were presented from Dr. Finn and Joe Dokes, which were very strong arguments that home grow is not a good idea. And so I would not be in favor of uh, moving to create legislation at this time for home grow, it's too early in the process. Um, if we, we can revisit it down the road if we need to, but I think we still need data from other states and uh, to make sure that we're not making a bad decision because of black market, trust me, you know, I, I believe that the black market will take advantage of this uh, as, as it has been seen in other states. Uh, yeah, and you know. Oh, no, hold, hold on, guys. We need to move along. Thank you, Joe. Ashley, you have your hand up. We need to let other people speak too, guys. That's what I, that's what I asked for earlier. So, I need to hold hear. on. Yeah, Dr. But I, I'm like like Ashley's you. not. Ashley's not a board member. Yeah, can oh, okay. I not respond? Can I not respond to that though? You know, I mean, we did hear some terrible horror stories from Mr. Finn and Mr. Dokes, and then both of them, when I asked straight up, of all of these scary cartel grows you're talking about, how many of these grows? were run or operated by legal medical cannabis card carrying patients. And they both said, not one. The horror stories that you're trying to paint are relevant in legal states, but not medical cannabis states where patients have to go and get their cert. They have to get certified by a certified physician. And then their names are on a registry. If you are, if you think that patients are going to get a medical cannabis card and then go turn themselves into some low budget scarface, knowing good and well that law enforcement has their name and knows exactly who they are and what they're growing. That's just, that's, I, I don't understand. I, I, I don't get the logic in that because there is no logic in that. It's just a way to maintain this nonsense. Okay. Dr. Okay. Milton, did you have a, a comment? I, th I'm, I do. I think we're missing another opportunity. Uh, we have established dispensaries for quality, consistency, purity, and standardization. And I am 
I am sympathetic to those who can't afford their medicines. I had a residence clinic this morning. We have people that can't afford their insulin. They can't afford their any hypertensives. And there's a method for them to get support. Maybe this committee, from a medical advisory standpoint, should be making re recommendations to the, the legislator. Why can't these people have Medicaid support or some other compassionate support to purchase their uh, their uh, medical cannabis at a dispensary where we know that this is, well, we assume that this is at quality, consistency, purity, and standardization. I think that's a better way than making recommendations about sourcing of homegrown. One man's opinion. Excellent idea, Dr. Milton. I, I think this is, this is the way we, we may need to go. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, great idea. Just wanted to say that. Can I chime in on, hey Rusty, can I chime in on the Medicare Medicaid issue? So, so this is Jesse Forbes. I've been on this board since it was created and, and I appreciate those comments. And we've had those, some of those discussions in the past. One issue from the legal end, and I'll just tell you legally, because that's sort of my, what I bring to this board, um, because this remains illegal federally, uh, you, you, you're not going to be in a position where, where Medicare can provide any support for this. Medicaid can't provide support for this because you have federal money that flows in for that. And private health insurance can't provide any support for this. So that, that's been a, a major concern since the beginning of how do how these patients in a severely depressed economic state um, get access to this, particularly now when, you know, even though the, 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 the office has made great strides in getting locations around the state, you know, gas is $5 a gallon. Um, and so it's very difficult for people to be able to get there. I, I appreciate that. And I like uh, the thought that Dr. Milton had of, is there a way that we could recommend to the legislature that there be some kind of fund for people that can't uh, afford this? That always comes down to dollars. And here, you're not going to be able to use anything that's, that, that has any federal dollars or insurance that's regulated federally uh, to, to provide any access to this. I also just wanted to follow up on one point earlier. Um, when I was talking about the concern I had from a legal standpoint of people buying street drugs, what I've seen in, in the criminal context around the state historically has been not a concern over the percentage of THC and what they're buying. It's that the drugs get laced with something else. They, you know, you have some 19 year old kid thinks they're buying marijuana and they're buying marijuana that's got fentanyl on it or it has um, bath salts on it or some other substance that they're not getting. And my understanding of, of what's happened with home grow around the country is, is to, someone made the point earlier, I think it was Jason, that the seeds would have to come from an approved dispensary. So we would still have the seed to sale tracking. The difference would be that it wouldn't, it wouldn't be um, then grown in a lab and then processed. And frankly, what we've heard from conversations throughout the years of, of other states, the in other states is people really can't do that on a state, uh, on a home level, um, where they're able to actually process this into higher concentrations of THC. But I do appreciate the, the comments. I understand Joe's position on this. I mean, he's, you've made that clear since the beginning of this. I spent a lot of time listening to the back and forth of it. Where I come down on it is, is I, I really think our duty as a board is to look at ways to help implement the program. That's what we're charged with. And from, from my position, if we have cancer patients that can't afford $5 gasoline and can't afford to get out to do this, uh, I believe that following the states that have allowed a limited number of plants uh, and something that our Senate has already essentially approved uh, makes sense. So that's where I'm at in it, but I respect and appreciate every, everyone else's opinion. And I really hope we can have these discussions moving forward where we don't, we don't turn them into where we get um, upset with other board members' positions. I mean, we all have positions, and I, I frankly think everybody is too fractured, not only on some of these positions, but on a lot of positions in this country right now. And I wish we could have these discussions without it becoming personal. Uh, I know it, it, does, it isn't personal to me that someone disagrees with me here. Uh, folks, I do want to point out for the members, we are pushing one o'clock. Uh, we do have a very large public uh, uh, presence here, uh, assuming uh, a significant amount of those will then want to comment. Uh, I don't want to get in the situation where board members have to start dropping off due to time. So, 
what do you think? I mean, I'm, I'm ready to make the motion to vote on it. And I think, you know, we need to have a roll call vote. And I think patients that have been paying attention to this need to know which board members stand with their access to, to medical cannabis and which ones don't. And, um, you know, I'm prepared to make the motion that the board recommend that the legislature add a home, add home grow language to the medical cannabis act with uh, strong language to prevent diversion. And that would be my motion. I'll second Rusty's motion. This is Jesse Forbes. All right. Rusty has asked for a roll call vote. Well, is there a discussion been... of the motion or not? Dr. Onzon, I'm going to defer to you as the board chair. Um, Have we not been discussing this for the past hour? I, I think we have. Um, Dr. Antolini, but to Joe's point too, I mean, I don't know if people are ready to vote on this right now or they want more discussion. I mean, this is at least the second or third time we've had this on here. So, um, Jason, so how so we should, I mean, go ahead. I think that I just want to add this comment, you know, um, understand, you know, and I only got to make one comment in all this half hour of discussion as a board member that's on the policy committee. And, you know, so, you know, that that is frustrating to me. Um, there are several board members that are not here today that I think would want to weigh in on this decision. And so I would think that all board members need to know that this is coming up for a vote before we actually have the vote so that we can get, you know, uh, a balanced perspective uh, from different folks when we actually make the vote, when we actually take the vote for this to move to move forward. So, hey, Dr. Hey, hold on, hold on. I, I moved for that at the last meeting, just to make sure the record's clear. I, at the last meeting, I, I asked that we table this and it be voted on at this meeting because there weren't people still at the, at the board meeting. And I, I just, I mean, procedurally, there's a motion in the second on the floor. If there's another motion, we can take it up. I, I don't want to jump the gun on anything, but I did at the last meeting um, suggest that we table this and take it up at this meeting. And I think it's reflected in the minutes. I can't speak to why other board members aren't here today, but um, certainly, you know, it, it, it's, I, I, I'm open to whatever um, the chair would recommend in this regard, but I think we do right now have a motion and a second on the floor. And, and I just wanna make clear that I, I, I was concerned about the very issue Joe had at the last meeting, but here we are again. So Dr. Amjad, you asked for me previously. Uh, I, my opinion is Jesse is right. Uh, there is a second in motion. Uh, if we try to uh, continue with discussion, we're going to end up in the exact same situation as the last board meeting where members have to drop off and a vote's impossible. All right, because we have a quorum, right? There's at least eight board members here. Yes, we do. Then, it, then we can call the roll to vote. All right. Dr. Amjad. Uh, I'll say no right now. I don't have enough personal information for me to make a decision. Mike Smith representing Jan Cahill. Trooper Smith, you have a vote, yay or nay? Sorry about that. I was mute. I had myself muted. Um, I had to vote no simply because one, on a weekly basis, I'm still getting diversion issues coming from dispensaries currently. So there's no way I'm ready to, to say to vote anything other than no. Joe Deegan. No. Dr. Kahn. I think uh, I have to wait. I need more information. Uh, we have a lot of discussion, a lot of questions. I appreciate that, but I need to wait. So is that yay, nay, or abstain? Nay. At this time, nay. Okay. Dr. Baglianti. No. That's it. Jesse. I vote yes. Don't matter now. Folks, please mute your microphone. Charlie, specifically. Uh, Rusty. Yes. Dr. Antolini. 
Yes. Dr. Milton. No. Joe Hatton. No. JJ Barnaby. No. All right, so I've got three yeses and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight no's. So eight to three, the motion fails. All right. Dr. Amjad, did you want to take up any other topics before we move to live public comment? I don't have anything, Jason, thanks. All right, Glenbo, will you please advance the slide? Glenba, yep, thank you. Back one, please. Sorry. Thank you. All right, folks, we do have a very large uh, amount of public on today's meeting. Uh, sorry, before I forget, Paula, please turn on the comment section. Uh, what we're going to have you do is put your name in the comment box and please only use it for that purpose. Uh, if you want to comment, put your name in the comment box and we will call on you one by one. Uh, we'll give you 90 seconds, as has been typical uh, during previous meetings. And your comment will have to end after that 90 seconds. We'll move on to the next person. All right, first is Aaron Carey. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Hi, so I don't know, those that are uh, unfamiliar to me, I'm a nurse in the Northern Panhandle. Um, I was a co-owner of a dispensary, sold it, so there's no um, financial interest except that, um, you know, supporting patients in their healing journeys. So I just like to address, there's, there's quite a few things, but to try to keep it condensed, the gentleman that mentioned data from other states, I mean, there's no state like ours. When are we going to stop trying to collect data from other states whenever every single even community has its own unique challenges, um, not only with access, but um, that's that's one thing. And like I said, this is going to be quick because I have quite a few notes jotted down. You know, um, thinking about low income and the percentage and the numbers of those suffering um, and living in poverty um, and the associated chronic illnesses that they um, have to deal with. Um, you know, helping to support them and, and, and teaching them how to grow their medicine and forming a relationship with it. Um, there's healing potential there um, to help uh, these people. And again, I worked hospice and was out traveling to places in the past hundred West Virginia. There are people, you know, that are elderly taking care of their loved ones that might not have access. You know, also, I'm not sure if you know how many nurses in West Virginia didn't renew their nursing license this past year. It was quite alarming. I saw it from the West Virginia Nurse Association. It was over a thousand. So, you know, um, that's one thing. Um, nurses could potentially help to monitor this. Um, uh, the other thing is also, I've been looking at the medical cannabis program fund for our state. I just wanna make a quick mention that 55 goes to the Bureau, 45% goes to substance abuse, uh, between substance abuse, division of justice, community service, law enforcement training and development program. I, this is a medical program and I don't see any funding going to educate medical professionals. So there is potential there. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else is seeing what I, picking up what I'm putting out here, um, but there are solutions. I also agree, like, I mean, if there, is there something within these, um, the program fund that okay, we'll be Ms. able to Carey, also not only be able to Ms. grow, Carey, but also to allowed. provide funds for products to help people. So there's, there's a lot of, Ms. I think, Carey, solutions. your time has elapsed, please. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, folks, I do want to correct my error. I said 90 seconds verbally. We put two minutes written. I did, did give the previous speaker two minutes, so we'll go with that. All right, Ashley Harper. Uh, thank you for allowing me a chance to speak. Uh, I myself, I've grown up here in West Virginia my entire life. Uh, I love it with all my heart. Uh, and I've had some unique experiences in which I know personally how much marijuana hand help people here. Uh, I had cancer twice in one year. It impacted me hard for, had to go through chemotherapies, very similar to Rusty. I uh, was able to 
uh, understand ways in which marijuana could have helped me and kept me from suffering mightily. On top of that, my, my father was a disabled Vietnam veteran. Uh, he was a Bronze Star winner. He had PTSD, suffered his entire life. If it could have been for marijuana, he may still be here. He committed suicide a year ago. So all of those other medications, all those pharmaceutical medications that he, as well as all the other opioid addicted uh, folks in West Virginia who have been lost. I work with seniors around the state in their homes daily. And over 95% of the cases, when we've had that discussion, they would agree with me their child would still be here if their path had only been marijuana. There have never been a recorded overdose of marijuana death in the state of West Virginia, ever. Yet we're going to let opioids completely destroy our foundation. I think it's time to do what's right for people. I think it's also time that we have an element of individual research and critical thinking on our own. I hate that we've only got 12 people that have to make those huge decisions for all of us out here. And again, I appreciate the time to be on here and speak about it. If anyone wants to reach out to me or if I could have a further discussion, I'd greatly uh, appreciate it. I'm always willing to listen from all sides and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, next up, we have two names in the box, Donna Massey and Brittany Elmore. I'm assuming that's one person. Hold on, we're trying to get on there. All righty, here we are. Can you hear us? Yes, go ahead. Okay, um, my name is Brittany Elmore. I'm actually a general manager for Greenlight Dispensary in Southern West Virginia in Princeton. I've got my one of my two of my bud tenders here actually. And honestly, what we want to do is invite anybody on this advisory board to come meet us. Uh, come in the dispensary. We can talk to you, educate anybody, any questions uh, that you all might have. Um, we have patients that would love to talk to you all. There's so many people, honestly, you all need to come down here and sit and talk to. I can't get, go into detail with them about them on here, you know, HIPAA laws and whatnot, but you all really need to get out in the communities. You all really need to start meeting people. And honestly, if you all come down here to Princeton, we're open arms and we'll, we, anything, any ideas, any questions, any brainstorming, we're here, we're wanting to get out. Thank you, Ms. Massey. Does anybody, has anybody ever set foot in a dispensary in West Virginia? on the advisory board? I'd be willing to bet I'm the only one. Okay. But this is, this is an invitation. This is no, nothing hostile, nothing like that. It's open arms and we just want, we want you, we are. We're telling you all to come down here. Come down here and meet us. Put your address in the uh, chat box. Okay, we can do that. <laughs> Okay. Next up, we have Michael H. Hey, uh, so I'll keep it short. Um, I think it's if if we think that voting against home growing is going to stop growing in this state, like we're naive. Like it's it's already going. Like I think um, from the stories that I've seen, this is my personal opinion, but seeing the amount of people that are getting stuff that had fentanyl laced in it and the overdoses that are, you know, people getting dosed with uh, their marijuana. Like, I think it would be in our best favor to make sure that the clients are, are, are can grow their own so they know where it's coming from if they can't, in fact, afford it. Um, I don't, I don't know. It just, that, that just blows my mind. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. But anyway, um, the other thing was too, is, is, I mean, I think it's, you know, like the first lady that came on and said, you know, our area is completely different. You know, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up dirt poor. I mean, dirt poor. The fact that if we didn't farm or we have our garden, you know, we didn't eat. You know, I mean, I don't see the, you know, it's just the West Virginia way, man. I mean, it's just how we are here. You know, I think if we have, you know, no money, then we have the, the means to do it ourselves. Then why shouldn't we be able to? You know, I don't know. That's all I got, man. You guys have a good day. 
Thank you. Let's see. Next up, Nathaniel W. Nathaniel, are you there? One more chance, Nathaniel W. All right, we'll move on to the next person, uh, Dr. Husted. Hi, everybody. I appreciate the time. Um, Jeremy Husted, I, uh, I work as an addiction psychiatrist. I don't have any interest disclosures. I don't run a dispensary. I don't protest against dispensaries or anything like that. The reality is um, I, I really appreciate you guys voting no to, um, to doing home grow right now. This program is still in its infancy. You know, we, we finally are learning the effects of this stuff on our state and to jump right into home grow with, uh, you know, our whole bodies, it, it seems way too premature, especially when there are some real concerns. Um, I, I can relate to people that have cancer. I had a, you know, I had a mother with cancer when I was a child uh, who, said that she was going to commit suicide if she ever got cancer because both of her um, both of her parents died of cancer when she was a child the reason she didn't was because she had my brother and i um the reality though with this is claiming that you know marijuana is this panacea this cure-all for all of life's ills whether it's cancer or ptsd or depression or opioid addiction is is kind of ridiculous and i would say the people of west virginia are smart enough to know that if you say everything is good for everything then maybe it's not quite so um, the reality is is that marijuana has some use for say chemotherapy um, nausea and actually we already have fda approved formulation of it marinol which you worry about the cost of it through these dispensaries which are robbing people blind some of them um, why not get it fda approved through your doctor um, if you're really struggling with it there are no medicines that we grow at home. There's no medicine that is made at home. Um, just because you say it, it's medicine doesn't make it so. Um, I feel bad for anybody that's lost loved ones of PTSD, but the reality is cannabis actually raises rates of suicide in younger people who have PTSD, not lowers it. There is no evidence that cannabis lowers opioid overdose deaths as much as I wish there were because I would gladly gladly encourage people to take it if it's going to reduce opioid overdoses but you know there's reality and perception and to to say that we should just ignore what every other state's been through or other countries that have been dealing with us a lot longer because we know better or we're different doctor doctor who said i need you to wrap up yep i appreciate everybody and thank you again for voting no today thank you All right, let's go back to Nathaniel Walton. Apparently, he was having technical issues. Hello, everybody. Is my mic working now? Yes, sir. Okay, so starting off as a patient today, I'd like to speak, and I'd like to answer something that uh, Dr. Husted just talked about with the prescription. I believe everything I've read about the Mr. Walton, we just lost you again. Many things I've heard today have been brought up many times over and over at multiple of the meetings. Uh, and it feels like we might just be wasting a little bit of time. All right, uh, I'm assuming Mr. Walton has concluded. And does anyone else from the public wish to comment? If you do, please put your name in the chat box. All right, I see no more names. Glenda, next slide, please. And. I do want to point out to the members, uh, there seems to be some sort of squiggly mark on the screen that was not part of OMC's presentation. Uh, I saw a name pop up and that mark then drew itself on the screen. So I have no idea what's going on with that, but it's not intended to be there. All right, from the members, do we have any action items for the next board meeting? I would like to invite Dr. Gerdman 
to come and present again because again i do think it's a problem that we have folks serving on this board who are trying and tasked to make decisions pertaining to medical cannabis that don't know what terpenes or cannabinoids are. And I think that there needs to be a proper education session happen. And I would be more than willing to reach out and make that, make that go down. This is Jesse. I, one suggestion I had is would we consider inviting some legislators to speak with us about what they, what they see upcoming in the next legislative session, and then maybe what we could help with, because again, you know, our role really is to make recommendations and try to do some of the work that that the legislature can't get out and do to talk to people and hear from the public as well as industry folks and, and medical people. And maybe there's some issues that that some of the um, legislators could tell us are going they expect to see upcoming uh, with bills that were introduced last session or are going to be introduced. And then maybe there's things that we could address through this committee to try to help with that. So. That would be my suggestion. And the, the other other suggestion I had would be, and, and I don't know, I mean, obviously DHHR would know all this much better than us or me, but um, uh, would we be able to do an in-person meeting at the next session? I think that, you know, to Joe's point earlier, it's very hard on this Zoom, unless we start allotting time for people to figure out when someone stopped talking so you can start trying to make your comments. And uh, it, I always felt that these were much more productive when they were in person. And course we've all had to adapt to the new virtual world with the pandemic but uh, hopefully maybe we'd be in a position where we could do an in-person meeting again by september thanks uh dr amjad i'm gonna push dr amjad i'm gonna push that one to you we previously explored uh space for that i had identified a space but due to the pandemic that was canceled uh what do you think about moving to at least a hybrid format yeah, I think we should have a hybrid format so that we can meet in person and then zoom in anyone who can't as part of the board. Okay. Good week. I, I, want, I want to add to this action item. What was the one subcommittee that can never get members to meet? It wasn't the policy one. But that was, which one was health it? and medical. Okay. They don't have enough members meeting each time, right? Because that was an issue before. Um, there are enough members uh, within the work group. However, attendance has been a problem, an ongoing problem. Yeah, well, to me, that's an action item to address those issues. And okay. um, just, a con just a clarification, what would uh, the topic be of Dr. Griderman's uh, presentation? I think there needs to be a, a general education session on on the medical efficacy of this plant. Like I say, I mean, there's. I just think that um, you know, if if we're going to be making recommendations uh, to the legislature to to try to make sure this is implemented properly, I cannot be the only person on this board that knows what a terpene profile is and how it works with the body. I cannot be the only person this board that knows what a cannabinoid profile is and i think he needs to educate not just our policy work group the entire board on the science behind medical cannabis because there's a lot of misinformation that gets thrown around these meetings and that misinformation in turn leads to it's going to lead to bad recommendations well okay then i would like to also you know have a person that i could recommend that's the thing. It's not. Why does it have to be a debate? If we're going to bring in a, a, lit, a literal leading expert on the like, I don't understand why it has to be a debate. Like, I mean, if if you've got somebody that's an expert on something, why are we intentionally going out to find someone whose opinion is different? That makes no sense. It doesn't help the conversation. It turns it into a debate and it turns it into theater. And I'm not interested in any more theater. Hey, this, is, this is JJ uh, Burnaby. I just want to make the comment that. You know, we all really have the responsibility to educate ourselves and, and the medical advisory board meeting really is a format for us to discuss uh, agenda topics and make uh, and make recommendations to the, the cannabis board. Um, you know, I, I, for one, don't need a mandatory seminar within the confines of the of the meeting to uh, educate myself. And that's, and, uh, you know, that's just the way I feel. I think it's a little condescending to say that nobody's educated and that we need an education session before we can discuss recommendations 
to the cannabis board. I mean, that's just how I feel personally. Well, I, you know, if we're going to bring in an expert to talk about that, I, I hear where Dr. Barnaby's coming. If that would be the case, then I think we make recommendations to Jason and Dr. Amjad about who that might be. Um, you know, I'm not insinuating that it needs to be a debate. I just don't know that I agree with Dr. Gerdman being, being the person that would be the, the right person to be doing the presentation. I mean, you're not have a right to, to say that. What if we had, the, what if we had experts pre present materials for the board to review? And that way, if someone, you know, if, if a board member has a particular expert that they think has information that could help further educate members of the board, that could be produced in some written format or, or some sort of PowerPoint presentation and sent to all of us I mean, from both, from both ends of this. I, I just, I mean, I, I do sort of see the point of, I think this is why the work groups are helpful because we can spend a lot more time. But if we're going to have an hour and a half meeting and we're going to have issues that we, you know, want to identify that that need to be tackled by this board, um, I'm not sure having having uh, a, an expert in, in, in on either side of this, if there are sides, uh, is going to be very productive. Could I have the name of this expert so I can follow up? Dr. Greg Gerdeman, G E R. Greg, go ahead. G E R D E M A N. And he's a medical doctor, PhD. Yes, sir. And he's left multiple public comments with this board. He's, I mean, he told me in conversation that it was getting frustrated because he kept submitting comments uh, and never got any fee he's i was literally the only person that ever emailed him back but if you go back through the com public comment sections of all the meetings um you'll find his contact information his credentials and he's opened himself up for um you know email and phone conversations with any member of the board pertaining to anything we're doing so all that information is in there um if you don't want to sift back through it i'd be happy to shoot you an email with all his contact information and all that stuff once we finish this meeting whatever's easier for you would you please thank you yes sir okay folks uh for clarification we've never had a debate on an action item before uh are we going to invite Dr. Gerdeman to speak at the next meeting or not? Or do you want to see materials from him first? I want to see materials. Are you okay with that, Rusty? Yeah, I'm good with that. I'll give him a call and, and see what he's willing to, to produce and, and get to us. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jesse, I need to jump back to your action item real quick. Uh, you indicated that you wanted members of the legislature to speak to the board. Um, are you going to facilitate that, or do you want the OMC to uh, facilitate uh, having members of the, of the legislature speak? I, I'm happy to do it either way. It was just sort of a suggestion that I think, you know, getting back to the purpose of this board, if we're, if we're going to make recommendations to the legislature, it might be helpful to know what they're really looking at and what they'd like from us for the next session. So I don't know whether that makes more sense, Jason, if you, you know, already know who, who's going to be um, sort of uh, pushing various items. If the office wants to do that, I'm fine with it. I'm also happy to try to facilitate that if the office doesn't want to do that. So whatever your preference is. I think maybe Dr. Amjad wants to chime in, but I think it would make more sense for you uh, to produce that member for the board uh, because there's always, uh, you know, political, uh, uh, political winds surrounding, surrounding that. I'm happy to reach out to, to try to see who, who would make the most sense. I know we've had legislators in the past talk to us, uh, but I'd, I'd like to kind of see, you know, who has bills upcoming or who has positions that might be helpful for us to look at. So I'll, I'll do that and, and get with you and let you know who, who I would recommend for the next meeting. Okay. But if we need to step in, we're always happy to help. And um, just throwing it out there, if, if you want, um, you know, the, the last bill that was introduced that passed through the Senate that, you know, uh, fixed a lot of the problems with the Medical Cannabis Act and also allowed patients to grow was sponsored by Senate Majority Leader Takubo and was co-sponsored by both of the physicians in the Senate, um, bipartisan. It was Doc Stallings and Dr. Maroney, um, you know, so I'm, I'm sure that uh, 
reaching out to them, they, they could point us in the right direction as far as who to come in and participate in that discussion. And Dr. Takubo spoke to us before. Um, I, think, I think maybe the others have too. So yeah, I, I'd be happy to reach out to Senator Takubo and, and see if he wants to come or if he has other suggestions of who would make sense. Sounds good. Any other action items for the next main meeting? Okay, moving on to the date. We've already uh, decided that it's gonna be a hybrid format. Uh, if we stick with the Thursday that we've been going with, the date would be 9.15. Uh, does that date or time of noon to 1.30 not work for any members? Are we gonna try for a central location or will we have to come to Charleston? So the facility that I have identified uh, that already has equipment uh, to facilitate the hybrid approach is at the Capitol. I, I had an issue on the date. Uh, this is Jesse. I've actually currently have a hearing scheduled at 11 o'clock on the 15th, um, which could be problematic. You know, have, I mean, it, it, it's pretty early. It may get moved, but would it be possible to, to try to look at the 14th, the Wednesday instead? Would anyone have an objection to that? I have standing meetings that second second uh, Wednesday. What about Tuesday? Wednesday. What about the 13th? If we started earlier and then, I mean, I've got a meeting that day at one o'clock. Just, just leave it on. Leave it Thursday the 15th. I'll, I'll figure my hearing out. Thanks. If, thir if Thursdays are better, uh, the Thursday before is the 8th and the Thursday afterwards is the 22nd. The 8th is okay with me. Yeah, the 8th is fine. Okay. Any other issues with the 8th? All right. Let's set it for September 8th, noon to 1.30 in a hybrid virtual in-person format at the Capitol. Now I'll get exact information out to, to everyone. Okay, um, again, the topics for discussion bullet is duplicative of uh, the action items. Dr. Amjad, that's all I have. Uh, if you wanna take a motion to close the meeting. Oh, Thank sorry, uh, yeah. th thanks Glenn. But, uh, if the public wishes to submit written comment, please send it to the email address on the screen with MCAB public comment in the subject line by July 1st. And back to you, Dr. Amjad. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Move. <laughs> Second. All right. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Joe.